south of Boston on a little farm outside Quincy, Massachusetts, an elderly John Quincy Adams, son of the founding father John Adams, was taking a quiet walk on a summer day. While he walked against the still backdrop of cricket chirps, thunder from cannons could be heard coming from Boston. Today was June 17, 1843, the 68th anniversary of the Battle of Bunker Hill. A special ceremony was underway in Charlestown, and the celebratory cannonade could be heard all the way from the Adams' ancestral home in Quincy. Constructed from the granite excavated from the quarries in Quincy, a new towering monument had recently been completed to commemorate the battle, and some of the most important politicians of the day were in Charlestown to unveil it. The President of the United States, John Tyler, was there, and so was one of Massachusetts' most famous politicians, Daniel Webster. But John Quincy Adams, himself a former President of the United States, had decided to stay home during the celebration. He could still remember that day vividly. 68 years ago to the day, the young boy John Quincy walked across the same family farm, hand in hand with his mother Abigail. As they looked north towards Boston, smoke and fire filled the sky. Thunder from cannons filled the air as Charlestown burned to the ground. The American Revolution now exploded in Boston and the future of America was now at stake. When we last saw our hero, John Adams, we had begun the process of uniting the farming settlements around Sanctuary. By reorganizing the Minutemen, we were able to convince the settlers at Abernathy Farm, Ten Pines Bluff, Oberland Station, and Greentop Nursery to join our rudimentary alliance. Along with the brand new settlements at Sanctuary and Sunshine Tidings Co-op, our alliance of settlements is growing stronger by the day. But still, our Minutemen Alliance is weak, and the threats in the Commonwealth are vast and varied. We need a way to strengthen our alliance quickly to better ensure the safety of our settlers. We can upgrade our cities and make them stronger, but upgrading cities takes considerable time and resources, and there might be a faster way to strengthen the Minutemen. Close by to our settlements, there are two strong, already established towns. If the settlements of Covenant and Bunker Hill could be allied with, the Minutemen would become noticeably more powerful. Covenant, with her high walls and excellent defenses, could become an important military outpost in our alliance, and Bunker Hill's established caravan relationships could prove to be an important economic boost to our alliance. If we could convince these small cities to ally with us and join the Minutemen, our collection of settlements could be a new power in the Commonwealth, and our goal of rebuilding civilization would be that much closer to completion. With that goal in mind, our hero John Adams is on his way to Bunker Hill to try to convince her citizens to join the Minutemen. The settlement at Bunker Hill is recognizable even to those travelers who have only spent a short time in the Commonwealth. Behind the high wooden walls protecting traders and settlers stands the pure white Bunker Hill monument piercing the sky. The history behind this monument has been lost to today's citizens of the Commonwealth, but the echoes of that history still live on in the monument. The Bunker Hill Obelisk was built to remember a battle that took place during the early days of the American Revolution in 1775, a full year before Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. The historic Battle of Bunker Hill, however, didn't actually take place on Bunker Hill, and the Bunker Hill Monument isn't actually built on Bunker Hill either. The Bunker Hill Monument resides on a hill called Breed's Hill. Breed's Hill is where the heaviest fighting took place during that hot June day. The real Bunker Hill lies a short walk to the northwest from Breed's Hill. Back in 1775, huge hills like Breed's Hill dotted the landscape of not only Charlestown, which is the town where Breed's Hill and Bunker Hill are located, but of Boston as well. In Boston, Beacon Hill and Copse Hill rose right alongside the colonists' churches and homes. Hills like these became landmarks for the city of Boston. Boston was inseparable from her hills. Atop the 138-foot Beacon Hill, Boston's highest hill, it was easy to see that Boston was almost completely surrounded by water. With the exception of the small sliver of land connecting Boston to the mainland, Boston was effectively an island. 
Fallout 4's Boston is much more like today's Boston, in which later 19th century Bostonians filled in the waterways around Boston to make room for new development. Back in the 1700s, much of Boston's land was still underwater. The area on Boston's west side, known as Back Bay, is called Back Bay because it used to literally be a bay on the back side of Boston. Only later was it filled in with dirt. Also, the castle, known back then as Castle William, sat on an island completely disconnected from the mainland. Many of these hilly islands similar to Boston dotted the coastline of Massachusetts. The neighboring town of Charlestown was topographically similar to Boston, with a slim neck that expanded into the island-like town of Charlestown, and with towering hills like Breed's Hill and Bunker Hill. Since only the slim Charles River separated Boston and Charlestown, the fates of these two cities were closely linked. Whatever happened in Boston affected Charlestown, and any battle taking place in Charlestown would have profound consequences for Boston. The Charlestown Peninsula would soon become the battleground for the Battle of Bunker Hill. But in April of 1775, on the eve of the American Revolution, that battle was still months away. When the Revolutionary War broke out in Concord on April 19, 1775, the fighting between the colonial militias and the British soldiers didn't immediately end at Concord. After driving the British across the Old North Bridge and out of Concord, the colonists kept pushing the British back down the road towards Boston. From behind the trees overshadowing the road, Minutemen and militiamen picked off shots at the retreating British. The fire from the colonists was constant. We were fired on from houses and behind trees and from all sides, British Lieutenant John Barker later wrote, but mostly from the rear, where people had hid themselves in houses till we had passed and fired. Militiamen from all across the countryside poured in to join this guerrilla-style offensive on the British columns. The British retreat became a brutal gauntlet of musket fire. As more and more colonists converged on the British formation, the risk of being cut off from Boston grew stronger. In order to avoid encirclement from other colonial militias by taking the long road to Boston through Cambridge, the British forces turned toward Charlestown instead. Upon reaching the safety of Charlestown, the British traveled by boat back to Boston under the protection of the British Navy warships floating in the harbor. With word of war now spreading across Massachusetts, bands of eager militias poured into Boston to support the cause. George Washington and John Adams' future Secretary of State, Timothy Pickering Jr., traveled to Cambridge all the way from Salem, Massachusetts. Several hundred men under his command came with him. Some men even traveled further, coming from towns in Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and Maine. Over the following week, 20,000 militia and Minutemen crowded the areas outside Boston, including Cambridge. All were anticipating what would take place next. On the morning of April 20th, the day after fighting broke out in Concord, Timothy Pickering was asked to attend an impromptu meeting in Cambridge. All the key militia officers gathered to determine what exactly they should do next. With thousands of men now in Cambridge, important decisions had to be made. Even though the British were now back in the impenetrable island fortress of Boston, the colonists' impulses were aimed towards war. Joining Timothy Pickering for that morning's meeting was perhaps the most important patriot in Boston, Dr. Joseph Warren. As a practicing physician, Dr. Warren had a high standing in Boston society. This Harvard-educated yet humble doctor was considered friendly by his peers and handsome by the ladies. But more importantly, he was now the leader of the Patriot cause in Boston. With Samuel Adams and John Hancock on their way to the Continental Congress in Philadelphia, the responsibility of leading the radical faction in Boston fell to Dr. Warren. In John Hancock's absence, Dr. Warren took over his role as President of the Provincial Congress, which was the new government for the rebellious Massachusetts colonists. Dr. Warren was also the Chairman of the Committee of Safety, the Committee of Safety was the committee with the Provincial Congress responsible for all military preparations, which meant that Warren had his hand in every aspect of preparing the colonists for war, which included everything from procuring gunpowder to commissioning officers. Dr. Warren's influence could be felt all over Boston. Warren's network of spies constantly reported to him all that took place in Boston. Only a day ago, on the morning of April 19th, 
Warren received intelligence that General Gage planned to seize or destroy the colonists' munitions in Concord. He summoned his friend Paul Revere and directed him to ride to Lexington and raise the alarm of the coming British. Despite Dr. Warren's important roles in government, his real passion was to fight alongside his fellow countrymen. When the British were retreating from Concord the previous day, Warren brandished his weapon and joined the fight. Joseph Warren's inclination to serve through military service meant that he was a natural fit for the meeting with Timothy Pickering and the other militia leaders on the morning of the 20th. As the meeting began, disagreements between these leading men materialized. Timothy Pickering believed that the events at Lexington and Concord were like the Stamp Act riots of 1765 and the Boston Massacre of 1770, which is to say that he believed that this outbreak of violence would be followed by some measure of British mediation. Negotiations with British General Thomas Gage would take place, and the colonists' desires would be met. There wasn't a need for all-out war. Others at the meeting weren't so pacifistic. Others thought that now was the time to strike, Pickering wrote, and cut off troops before they were reinforced. And then, said they, the day will be our own. Chief among those advocating for action was Joseph Warren. A New England army had assembled in Cambridge overnight. If there was ever a time to free Boston from British occupation, the time would be now. Given his standing in Patriot ranks, Warren's appeal carried more weight than those calling for peace. The majority of the colonists were now ready for action anyway. The wheels of war were already in motion. The meeting adjourned with a decision. Massachusetts would go to war. When the people have decided to go to war, a general must rise to the occasion to meet that decision. The Minutemen have found that general in our hero, John Adams. As General Adams approaches the settlement at Bunker Hill, he hopes he can retrace the history of his Massachusetts forefathers. But instead of forming an army of men from different colonies like Connecticut and Rhode Island, General Adams hopes he can form an army from different settlements like Bunker Hill and Covenant. Now, Convincing Bunker Hill to join our alliance won't be easy, though. General Adams needs to establish a relationship with Bunker Hill's settlers. Sure. We must convince them that we are worth joining. After talking to the shopkeepers around Bunker Hill, we learn that Bunker Hill pays protection money to a group of local raiders. These raiders threaten the prosperity of the people at Bunker Hill. Helping the people of Bunker Hill with their raider problem might be enough to convince them to join the Minutemen. And now that General Adams is starting to gain a reputation, even Mayor Kessler wants our help. Our town works because everyone knows we got the raider angle covered. The gangs get paid off and leave our caravans alone. But Zeller's army is getting greedy, asking for more caps. And after we pay them, the bastards still hit our people. But I found out the army's holed up in an old prep school. The job's simple. Deal with them. If we can free Bunker Hill from Zeller's raider army, Mayor Kessler might be convinced to join our cause. War with the local raider tribe is the perfect job for our general. The business of war always requires a general who is ready for action. But when war came to Massachusetts in 1775, the provincial army's general wasn't quite as ready as our General Adams. When word of the fighting at Lexington and Concord reached Artemis Ward, he was still lying in his bed. While the men from his town ran off to join the fight, Artemis Ward stayed behind in his bed, not because he was afraid, but because he was sick. Artemis Ward, the highest ranking general of the recently formed colonial army, suffered from the stones. Incredible pain had kept General Ward bedridden for days. Unable to move from his bed, Ward was in no condition to travel when the alarm for action was raised on April 19th. However, early in the morning on Thursday, April 20th, Artemis Ward made himself ready. Dressed in his militia general's uniform, Ward climbed into the saddle of his horse and rode off towards Cambridge. The 40-mile trek to Cambridge took him all day, and the stones would have made the pain from the experience nearly unbearable, but the general's virtues would not allow him to rest at home. While well respected by his fellow New Englanders, Artemis Ward did not project the image of a dashing general. This heavyset man enjoyed a quiet, sedentary life in the country, possibly a little too sedentary. All of this sudden action only showed that he was a little too sick, a little too exhausted, and a little too fat. But as soon as he arrived in Cambridge, General Ward called a meeting with all the ranking officers, the first official council of war of the American Revolution. 
the colonists had completely surrounded Boston. Camps of militias and minutemen dotted the countryside, and, more importantly, troops in Roxbury cut off any supplies from crossing the Neck into Boston. Boston, now an island fortress, could only be resupplied from sea. Soon, a new ship named Cerberus sailed into Boston Harbor. Named after the mythical three-headed dog that guards the gates of hell, Cerberus carried something more than just supplies. Among her passengers were the Major Generals William Howe, Henry Clinton, and John Burgoyne, three British generals that were determined to unleash hell on the American rebels. As Lieutenant General, Thomas Gage outranked Major Generals Howe, Clinton, and Burgoyne, but their presence in Boston did not demonstrate a vote of confidence from the British government. Parliament and the King wanted results. Upon reaching Boston, Howe, Clinton, and Burgoyne were updated on the unfortunate British position in Boston. When General John Burgoyne learned of the impromptu provincial army surrounding Boston, he exclaimed, What? 10,000 peasants keep 5,000 king's troops shut up? Well, let us get in, and we'll soon find out, Bogroom. Although he was a bit of an arrogant showman by nature, Burgoyne did have reason to boast. This new lineup of British generals was a formidable team. Burgoyne himself had developed a reputation for bravery during his time in European wars. He also was an established playwright and a strong writer. His play, The Maid of Oaks, had recently met success in London. General Henry Clinton, on the other hand, was in many ways the opposite of Burgoyne's flashy persona. Shy and socially awkward, Henry Clinton didn't always get along with his peers. Despite being what he himself called a, quote, shy bitch, Clinton was ambitious and intelligent. He had made a name for himself fighting in Europe during the Seven Years' War, and now all his skills would be needed in America. Since Clinton and Burgoyne had served in Europe during the Seven Years' War, only one general had close ties to the colonies. Called to serve in America during the Seven Years' War, otherwise known as the French and Indian War, William Howe was the most senior of the three major generals. Howe had a reputation as a fighter. In 1759, Howe commanded a battalion of light infantry during the Siege of Quebec. Howe's commanding officer chose him to lead a key assault during the battle, which helped secure a British victory. Even though Howe's service during the French and Indian War had earned him the respect of the colonists, it was Howe's older brother who was truly beloved by the Massachusetts colonists. In 1758, Brigadier General George Howe was killed during an assault on Fort Ticonderoga. He died while fighting alongside soldiers from the colonies. George Howe was so admired by the Massachusetts soldiers that the colony paid for a memorial for him in Westminster Abbey. Now, standing on top of Beacon Hill, William Howe looked out across Boston's back bay. These gruff and grimy militiamen in the distance encircling Boston were once his allies. Some of these soldiers had even served alongside his brother. Now they were his enemies. More importantly, they were enemies to the crown. Across the water from General Howe stood Israel Putnam, one of those soldiers who had fought alongside his brother. Israel Putnam had held George Howe in his arms when he died in 1758. Now a major general in the newly formed Army of Observation under Artemis Ward, Putnam stood as an adversary to the brother of the man he once fought with and admired. As April turned to May and May to June, both the British Army and the New England Army of Observation were at an impasse. The topography of Boston prevented both armies from attacking each other. Outside of a few skirmishes, no major conflict could take place. Serious military planning was needed in order to break the stalemate. Back in Boston, Thomas Gage discussed with his three major generals the best way to defeat the rebel army. They decided that on Sunday, June 18th, while many of the colonists were attending church services, Burgoyne would begin firing cannons at the New England Army's position at Roxbury. General Clinton would then cross the Neck out of Boston and lead an attack on the rebel forces at Roxbury. While the rebels were occupied, General Howe would lead a group of soldiers to Dorchester Heights, east of Roxbury. Taking the hills at Dorchester Heights would give General Howe the high ground in the battle. The British would have the upper hand and could force a rebel retreat. After the New England Army was in full retreat, Howe would change directions and attack Charlestown on the other side of Boston. 
Once Breed's Hill and Bunker Hill were secured, a final assault on the Army's headquarters at Cambridge could commence. Their plan was a good one, and it might have been successful too, if it weren't for one problem. Word of their plan had already reached the colonists. Artemis Ward and the other leaders of the colonial army decided that preemptive action needed to be taken place to upset the British plans. Instead of trying to take Dorchester Heights, which would prove difficult, Israel Putnam suggested that the New England army should take the unoccupied high ground overlooking Charlestown. So, on the evening of Friday, June 16th, two days before the supposed British attack, General Israel Putnam and a handful of other officers led over 1,000 men out of Cambridge, across the narrow Charlestown Neck, and up the 110-foot-high Bunkers Hill. The official orders called for the men to ascend Bunker Hill and, under the cover of night, build fortifications to defend their position on the hill. A fort on Bunker Hill would provide a good defensive position against any British attempt to take Charlestown. For some reason, however, this plan was quickly abandoned. No one knows what truly happened that night, but after General Putnam met with two other officers, Colonel William Prescott and the engineer and artillery commander, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Gridley, they decided that they should move on to take Breed's Hill to the southeast. Between the three officers, we don't really know who made the decision to move on to Breed's Hill, but the consequences of that decision were monumental. Although it was shorter than Bunker Hill, Breed's Hill was strategically more important than Bunker Hill. Breed's Hill overlooked not only Charlestown, but Boston Harbor as well. By building a fort on Breed's Hill, the colonists posed a direct threat to the British men-of-war ships in the harbor. Cannons placed on Breed's Hill could easily attack the vulnerable British ships. A fort on Breed's Hill was not a defensive position, like a fort on Bunker Hill would be. It was an offensive position. It was a position that General Gage simply could not ignore. At first light, Gage and his generals finally saw the trouble they were in. Under the cover of night, the New England soldiers built an earth fortification known as a redoubt on Breed's Hill. And now, as the sun revealed their threatening creation, Gage had no choice but to act. Immediately, the British ships in the harbor opened fire. The Battle of Bunker Hill had begun. Nine-pound cannonballs began raining on the men in what now seemed like an exposed redoubt. But apart from the occasional lucky decapitation, the volley of cannon fire was ineffective at killing the colonists. The constant cannon barrage, however, was very effective at instilling fear. Now feeling hopelessly outgunned by the impressive warships in the harbor and the massive batteries on Copps Hill in Boston, the New England soldiers in the redoubt were understandably afraid. But cutting through the veil of fear looming over the soldiers, Colonel Prescott jumped onto the parapet of the redoubt in plain view of the cannons. Walking along the edge of the fortification, Prescott called out to the British, taunting them while waving his hat at them. Across the water in Boston, General Gage could see through his telescope a man standing precariously on the edge of the fort. He handed the telescope to a loyalist standing next to him and asked him if he knew the man. The loyalist recognized Prescott as his own brother-in-law. Will he fight? Gage asked. Yes, sir. He is an old soldier and will fight as long as a drop of blood remains in his veins. General Gage's troops were also ready for a fight. By early afternoon, waves of boats filled with British regulars were crossing the bay to Charlestown. Soon, General Howe himself crossed as well. Once all of his forces gathered on the shores of Charlestown, General Howe would lead his army in battle. But it would take time for all his troops to muster on the edge of the peninsula, time that allowed the colonists to reinforce their position. In this extra time, much needed reinforcements arrived for the entrenched colonists. 46-year-old Colonel John Stark from New Hampshire arrived with a whole regiment of fresh soldiers. Colonel Stark, like many of his fellow officers, had a reputation as a rough frontiersman. While in his 20s, Stark had been captured by a group of Indians, but they were so impressed by his bravery that they adopted him into their tribe. Now, as Colonel Stark reached the soldiers at Breed's Hill, he could see the extremely dangerous situation he had entered. Before Stark arrived, Prescott and his men built an earthen wall called a breastwork to protect the left flank of the redoubt. To further protect the exposed redoubt, other soldiers fortified a pre-existing wall running along the rest of the peninsula. By adding wood, stone, and grass to an already existing fence, the soldiers were able to make what was soon dubbed the rail fence, which provided a serviceable barricade along the width of the peninsula to the left of Breed's Hill. These fortifications, however, were not enough to impress Stark. 
Colonel Stark couldn't understand the thinking behind Putnam's and Prescott's decision to build a redoubt on such an exposed hill. The rail fence helped in shoring up the redoubt's defenses, but Stark immediately noticed two critical weaknesses. Between the rail fence and the breastwork on top of Breed's Hill, there existed a significant gap. Although the marshy ground would slow any British advance through the opening, the gap still needed to be plugged. Soon, three V-shaped defenses, called flaches, were quickly constructed to fill the opening. The second weakness Colonel Stark discovered came at the other end of the rail fence. At the edge of the peninsula, where the rail fence ended, a sharp bank dropped down to the shoreline. This beach running along the Mystic River was left completely undefended. All General Howe needed to do to bypass the colonists' defenses was to run his soldiers along the beach and attack the colonists from behind. Stark saw the threat the scat posed and posted three rows of his best men to protect it. Everything was now in place for the coming British attack, but not everyone had arrived. One final reinforcement joined the colonists in the 11th hour before the battle. Greeted by the cheers and huzzas of his fellow soldiers, Dr. Joseph Warren walked past the relative safety of Bunker Hill and entered the redoubt on Breed's Hill. Dr. Warren was recently granted the rank of Major General in the Army, but when Colonel Prescott asked if he wanted to take command of his men in the redoubt, Warren declined. Warren was there to fight and to serve. Even though he was the most powerful man in the rebellious Massachusetts government, Dr. Warren took on the role of a common soldier with his fellow colonists. Dr. Warren's courageous step into the most dangerous spot on the battlefield boosted the morale of his fellow soldiers in the redoubt. He was there to fight. Now the men were ready for whatever General Howe had planned. Howe's plan to defeat the rebel army involved three simultaneous assaults. On Howe's left, a large force would attack the redoubt and breastwork on Breed's Hill. In the middle, Howe would lead another large force against the rail fence. And finally, on Howe's right, a smaller force would attack along the beach. In Howe's mind, this assault on the beach was the most critical part of the battle. If his soldiers could break through the defenses on the beach, then the colonists' left flank would be exposed, and the battle's tide would turn towards Britain's favor. Muskets in those days were not as accurate as our modern guns. For muskets to produce the deadliest effect, they often had to be fired from relatively close distances. This meant that oftentimes close quarters combat was a more effective strategy for winning battles. Soldiers with bayonets could completely overwhelm soldiers without bayonets if they got close enough. If Howe's soldiers could remain in formation and advance close enough to use their bayonets, the battle might be theirs. While Howe's men lined up in preparation for the assault, some of Colonel Prescott's men began firing at them from inside the abandoned houses in Charlestown. Howe ordered that the town be set on fire. With Charlestown burning to the ground, Howe and his men advanced toward the New England army. With heads down and bayonets at the ready, rows and rows of British light infantry rushed towards the colonists lined up on the beach. In order to maximize the effectiveness of their limited gunpowder, the colonists were ordered, as the legend says, not to fire until they could see the whites of their eyes. In an instant, flame and smoke clouded the beach as the first row of British soldiers dropped. The three rows of New England soldiers took turns firing, so as soon as the first volley fired, a second volley of musket balls cut down the next row of British soldiers. A continuous sheet of fire poured over the British as row after row dropped dead. The result, as Colonel Stark later said, was that the dead lay as thick as sheep in a fold. The British infantry never stood a chance. Soon the remaining soldiers realized this and fled. Howe's two main forces charging the rail fence in the redoubt didn't fare much better. Constant fire from the rail fence in the redoubt prevented the two British assaults from getting anywhere within bayonet range. As British soldiers dropped left and right, many of the soldiers panicked and fired back at the colonists. Discipline broke down and the advancing formations stopped in their tracks. Howe's plan crashed to a halt. His army was being cut down right before his eyes. Even though all the soldiers around Howe were dying, miraculously, Howe walked away unscathed. There was a moment I have never felt before. Howe was stunned by his defeat. These dirty farmers managed to repel the full might of the British Empire. In anger and shame, General Howe walked back down the hill, passing through a field of his dead soldiers on the way. After the failed assaults on the rail fence and the redoubt, he gathered his forces and made plans for a new assault. 
Instead of dividing his forces between the rail fence and the redoubt, Howe would focus all of his energy into the redoubt. While cannons pounded the breastwork on Breed's Hill, General Howe organized his men into columns instead of lines. By advancing up the hill in single file lines, the soldiers became less of a target for the colonists. Only the first man in each column was exposed to colonial fire, and if he fell, another man would replace him and lead the charge up the hill. In this formation, the British made their final assault up Breed's Hill. Despite the continuous fire coming from the colonists, the British soldiers relentlessly charged toward the redoubt. British soldiers collapsed on Breed's Hill as musket balls rained from the redoubt. It didn't matter though, the British were determined to take the hill. And soon they did. The British soldiers reached the top of Breed's Hill and stormed the redoubt. The redoubt was suddenly overrun by the British. The British bayonets sliced through the colonists as they attempted a retreat. The rage and ferocity of the British now fell upon the Americans. Colonel Prescott and General Warren guarded the retreat as their men escaped the redoubt. In the fury and chaos of the battle, as American and British soldiers fought hand to hand, General Warren demonstrated both strength and bravery. With a sword in hand, he rallied his men outside the redoubt as they were retreating, but about 60 yards from the redoubt, while still protecting his countrymen, General Joseph Warren was shot in the head. When General Howe learned about Dr. Warren's death the following morning, he thought it wasn't true. He couldn't understand how someone so vital to the American cause could put himself in harm's way on the front lines. Once Dr. Warren's body was verified, General Howe said that this victim was worth 500 of their men. When Abigail Adams learned of Dr. Warren's death, she wrote to her husband John Adams at the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. The day, perhaps the decisive day, has come on which the fate of America depends. My bursting heart must find vent at my pen. I have just heard that our dear friend Dr. Warren is no more, but fell gloriously fighting for his country, saying better to die honorably in the field than ignominiously hang upon the gallows. Great is our loss. Joseph Warren was only 34 years old on the day of his death. Despite all he had accomplished in the fight against the British, his greatest days were most certainly ahead of him. Now forgotten by history, Dr. Warren could have become one of America's founding fathers, comparable to a Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, or John Adams. But instead, Dr. Warren's legacy was cut short by the legacy of war. The legacy of war that never changes. The legacy of death and destruction. Although the British won the Battle of Bunker Hill, their victory came with great death and destruction. Nearly half of the 2,000 British soldiers had been killed or wounded. The Americans only counted around 400 casualties. The Battle of Bunker Hill was the first true battle of the American Revolution. Up until this point, the possibility of reconciliation with Britain had remained open. Now that possibility was gone. America and the British Empire were now at war. After the British took Bunker Hill, they did not have enough strength to pursue the Americans back to Cambridge. Another stalemate was reached, and the dividing lines between American and British troops looked eerily similar to what they had been before the battle. The British were still safely fortified in Boston, and the Americans still had them surrounded. If the siege of Boston was going to end, the Americans would need new leadership for a decisive victory. On his way to Boston to assume command of the American army, the newly commissioned General George Washington would meet that need. General Washington knew that he had a chance to end the siege of Boston and British tyranny in one final act. He was committed to achieving victory, even if that required burning all of Boston to the ground. Many years after the Battle of Bunker Hill, John Quincy Adams, now an old man, reflected on what he saw as a young boy. I saw with my own eyes those fires, and heard Britannia's thunders in the Battle of Bunker's Hill, and witnessed the tears of my mother, and mingled them with my own. That tragic June day exacted a heavy toll on both the Americans and the British, but the blood spilled on that hill paved a path toward a new American way of life, a path towards freedom. And as our hero John Adams fights for the freedom of the settlers at Bunker Hill, we learn that the path towards freedom is not always a straight one. After helping Bunker Hill with their raider problem, 
Mayor Kessler is still reluctant to join the Minutemen. Yeah, right. The Minutemen abandoned our sorry asses long ago. A lot of people's kin died because of that. Listen, you did us a good turn, but it would take a hell of a lot more for me to want to deal with the Minutemen. Even though Bunker Hill would be a great ally, an alliance with them will have to wait. At least we can say that we are on the right path to earning their trust. Trust goes both ways, though, and as it turns out, Covenant wasn't as trustworthy as their pristine exterior led us to believe. Our disagreement with them couldn't be resolved through negotiations. Just like at the Battle of Bunker Hill, sometimes violence is unavoidable. Covenant will make an excellent addition to our Minutemen Alliance, that is, once it's been repopulated. Until then, General Adams will continue to build on what he has. The Minutemen are gaining in strength, and now there is hope for a better tomorrow. But as history shows us, the pathway towards civilization is always covered in blood. For the hero and the statesman, his war is just beginning.